Hello everyone and welcome to part 3 of making a cloud game. By part 2 we had programmed the encoding and decoding scripts to allow for smooth movement replication. In this video we will pretty much change all the existing stuff to allow for a more simple game joining and leaving mechanism. This may seem underwhelming given what we have done so far, but this will be very, very useful when we get to the tic-tac-toe game mechanics later on. Also, as a quick note, if you have not watched parts 1 and 2, click on the card up here to watch them right now. So, let's get right into the program. First off, we head into the player sprite and delete both the when green flag is clicked event and the when space key is pressed event. We can also get rid of the pre-movement custom block. With this done, we can throw in the decoding functions into the opponent's sprite. This will include the functions get cloud data for, begin decoding of, and get next value. Okay, now we can head back into the player sprite and throw out each one of these blocks. Since we will no longer be using the aforementioned blocks in the player sprite, we can also delete the variables that we used in them. This will include ypause, xpause, player and letter id. Now that we have removed those things, let me explain why we did so. Given that we will allow for two players to join the game, there would be two different projects running simultaneously. In project number one, the first player will have the player scripts running and in project number two, the second player will have the player scripts running. Thus, each will be encoding their information to their respective cloud variables. Player 1's data will go into the cloud variable P1 and player 2's data will go into the cloud variable P2. Since it is only the other player's data that we require, we can do the decoding in the opponent sprite. Thus, we can have just the encoding done in the player sprite and just the decoding done in the opponent sprite. This is very efficient. Alright, let us now change the send cloud data function. Sending the x and y coordinates of the mouse is quite pointless, so instead of that we will send the username so that both the players can know who their opponents are. After this, we will encode the round value of timer multiplied by 10. I will explain why we are doing this later on, just follow me for the moment. It should also be obvious that we must edit the last line of code. If the player is player number 1, then we will set P1 to encode it. However, if the player number is player 2, then we have to set P2 to encode it. So we can throw this block out and instead create a new function called update cloud variable followed by an input of player number to another input of encoded. Like the other custom blocks, we will run without screen refresh. Within this custom block, we will do something that should be quite simple. If the player number is 1, then we set P1 to encode it. And if player number is 2, then we set P2 to encode it. When we put the function implementation, we are in for a small dilemma. What input do we put in for the player number? At the moment, we can simply create a new variable for all sprites called myPlayerNumber for storing the player number of the player in the game. Okay, we can update cloud variable myPlayerNumber to encoded. We can now create the main script that will use all of these functions. So when the green flag is clicked, we set myPlayerNumber to zero. This may seem contradictory because we would want to set the variable to 1 or 2, but it will make sense soon. We broadcast a new message called setup opponent clone and await. Then we switch the backdrop to joining and finally we broadcast another new message called join game and wait. Alright, let me now explain the easy stuff. If you head into the backdrops tab, you will see 9 different backdrops and we will use each one of these during a particular part of the game. 
However, in this video, we will only be using four of them. The blank backdrop when the game is in play, the joining backdrop when a player is joining the game, the joined backdrop to indicate that the player has successfully connected to the game, and finally, the full backdrop to indicate that there are already two players playing the game, so there are no more free slots. Great, let me now explain what each message would accomplish. When the setup opponent clone message is broadcasted, the opponent sprite will get ready to perform the check for auto game joining. When the join game message is broadcasted, the opponent performs a series of steps to check if there is an empty slot available. If there is, then the player is given a player number and is allowed to enter the game, and if there isn't, then we show the full backdrop. Alright, let us actually move ahead and program these steps. When setup opponent clone is received, we will have to perform a number of lines of code extremely fast. For this, we create a new custom block called create opponent clone, making sure to run without screen refresh. We must of course execute that block when we receive the message. So let us now define the create opponent clone block. Initially, we will hide the sprite and then create a variable called player number for the sprite only. We set player number to one and then create a clone and then change player number by one again. Okay, what is going on here? The player number variable functions essentially as a clone ID. The clone that we created will have its player number variable set to one, while the sprite itself will have its player number variable set to two. Let us move on to the join game message. I mentioned earlier that we will program a series of steps that will allow us to find out whether there is an empty slot or not. Well, here is the algorithm that we will use to find that out. First, the value of both the cloud variables is stored. After three seconds, the current value of the cloud variables is compared to the previously stored values. If the cloud variables have changed during the three second interval, then it means that the game is already full. If one of the cloud variables has not changed, then it indicates that there is an empty slot, so we allow the new player to join. Now, you may ask, how would we know for sure that a cloud variable would keep changing if there is another player online? After all, if a person does nothing but is connected, wouldn't the variable stay the same? The answer is no. If you take a look at the send cloud data function in the player sprite, you will notice that we encoded the timer. The timer is always changing if the player is in the project. Thus, if the cloud variable has not changed in three seconds, then we can say with certainty that there is an empty slot. Alright, let us now program what I just mentioned. First, we will get the cloud data for player number. Since the join game message will be received by both the sprite and the clone, each one will get the cloud data from a different cloud variable. For the clone, it would be P1 and for the sprite, it would be P2. Now, follow me along for the rest of the steps and I will explain the logic right at the end. We first create a variable called last value for this sprite only. We set it to the joint value of A and value. We wait for three seconds and then get the cloud data again. If the joint value of A and value is equal to the last value, then we set my player number to player number. Since I explained the algorithm earlier, you should be able to understand most of this. The last value variable stores the cloud variable and then after three seconds is used again to make a second comparison. You may not understand, however, why we join A to both value and last value. The reason we do it is to avoid integer comparisons and instead use string comparisons. Take this example. Here I am in a separate project comparing the value of P1 and P1 plus 1. Obviously, this should return false 
and it does do so for small values of p. However, if we set p to an extremely large value and then perform the same operation, the return value is actually true. This error occurs because Scratch rounds off extremely large integers. Fixing this error is quite easy. Just adding a letter at the beginning of each number allows for the correct comparison. Alright, getting back to our code, you can see that the myplayer number variable at the end is set to the empty slot if the game is not already full. Let's get back to the player sprite and continue the script. If myplayer number is greater than zero, we switch backdrop to joint and then broadcast a new message called start game. Within the else statement, we switch backdrop to full, wait for two seconds, then stop all. This should be quite self-evident. If my player number is greater than zero, then it means that there was an empty slot, so we can start the actual game. If the my player number variable is still at zero, then it means that the game was already full. Great, we can now move on to the main start game message. Within a forever loop, we check if my player number is greater than zero. This confirms whether the player is in one of the two game slots. If yes, then we use the send cloud data function. That's all we have to do for the player sprite. We can switch to the opponent sprite to program the join game message there. Once again, we get into a forever loop, but this time we check if my player number is equal to player number. If this condition is true, then it means that there is no longer any need for the clone because its functions are already performed by the player sprite itself. So we hide the sprite or clone. To get the decoding work quickly, we create a custom block called a tick, making sure to run without screen refresh. Okay, let's define the block. First, we get cloud data for player number. We duplicate the value condition, except that we use an if then else rather than an if then. We create a new variable called offline for the sprite only. At the start of the create opponent clone function, we set offline to 100. We also do the same thing before hiding the sprite or clone in the main loop. Okay, let's get back into the tick custom block. If the condition is true, then we change offline by one. We check if offline is equal to 100, and if yes, then we hide the sprite. Within the else statement, we set last value to the joint value of A and value. If offline is greater than 99, then we show the sprite and then set offline to zero. Great, that was a lot of code, so let me explain how the offline variable will work. At the beginning, it is 100. If the opponent player is online in his project, then the last value variable will keep on updating and the offline variable would basically stay as zero. However, when the opponent leaves the game, the value condition evaluates to true and the offline variable keeps incrementing till it gets to 100. Once it does, the opponent sprite hides signaling that the opponent player has left the game. Alright, the last thing we'll do in this video is to have the opponent player's username being told by the sprite. For this, we will begin decoding of value, then get next value. At this point, the value variable has the username, so we just say value. And that will be it. Once again, we can test out the program with the two-tab interface. Once you connect on both projects, you should see the opponent cat pop up on the right with the opponent's name. This stays as long as the opponent is online, and when the stop button is pressed, the opponent cat disappears in a few seconds. Fantastic! Now that we have completed the auto game joining mechanism, the backbone of the game, the cloud engine is finally ready. We can now move on and make the more fun part of the game, 
which is the game mechanics. With that said, thank you all for watching and I will see you in part 4.